All right, we have one attendee in so far, so that it's open and people can come in, so it's good. Kayla, since we're not getting started until 5.30, you can go ahead and turn off your, uh, your video if you'd like. We'll cue you. It's good to have somebody at the podium on the Pleasant Street Center because it's hard to tell if I froze again or if we're good. Thanks, Aaron. Now I can see that there's movement. It's good. Are we recording this, Aaron? Yeah, we are. Never mind. I see it. Use that conference, kind of the opposite order, but a bunch of us met in the superintendent. That was interesting. First time I ever saw that I. Um, Aaron, do you want attendees to be able to raise their hand? Did you see that, Jane? No, I didn't see anything. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, you're all set. Great, thanks.
as a time check, it is seven, it's, sorry, it's 527. We have six attendees. It's 529. I'm going to ask panelists to turn on their cameras, please. Ms. Schaefer, I'm going to ask that you, there we go. Turn on the mic so you can hear you. I'll go quiet. Uh, Jane. Thank you. I don't know if I can answer that question right now. Okay. Sorry, Bob. Could you let us know, Jane, if uh, who any elected officials may be on the webinar? We have um, select board member Chris Haley attending presently. Thank you. I can hear someone whispering. <laughs> it's a hot mic. <laughs> okay. Count us down, Jane. We'll get started. All right. I'm going to um, just remind folks that uh, to stay muted until you are called and introduced by our host this evening. Three, two, one. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Town of Reading's fifth annual Economic Development Summit. My name is Erin Schaefer and I'm the Economic Development Director with the Town. I'll be hosting this evening with my assistant, with assistance from my colleague, Jane Wellman. And we have a couple of folks that are uh, coming into the room as we speak as well. And welcome. Sorry about that. Um, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping points. Tonight's presentation is in a webinar presentation format where virtual attendees are muted, the video is disabled, and the chat function is also not available. The summit is being offered as a hybrid presentation, which means that attendees are also joining in person tonight at the Pleasant Street Center. Um, folks are also participating, again, through Zoom webinar, by phone, and are watching on RCTV live stream. This meeting is being recorded by the town and also by RCTV, and a recording will be available on the Town of Reading's website and the RCTV YouTube channel in the next few days. And with that, it's my sincerest pleasure to welcome Senator Lewis, who is joining us virtually, Jesse Wyman, Local Rapid Recovery Consultant with Faberman Design Consulting, Liz Whitelem, who is joining us in person tonight with the Reading Business Improvement District, she's the co-chair, and Scott Ritter, Senior Landscape Architect with Beta Group, which is an engineering planning and construction services firm. We are also joined tonight by Reading Town Manager, Bob Lillisher, and our Assistant Town Manager, Jean Delios, who will also be making remarks this evening. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Chris Haley and other elected officials and my colleagues who are joining us virtually tonight as well. Thank you to our community partner, RCTV, who's recording this meeting. And we're really looking forward to an evening of presentations that highlight downtown Reading's economic growth, resilience, 
and COVID recovery efforts. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Senator Lewis for his remarks. Senator Lewis. Great, thank you so much, Erin, and good evening, everybody. I'm so pleased to be able to join you all for this um, evening's Economic Development Summit. I want to applaud the town's leaders for organizing this event. As we all know, it comes at a critical time as we are recovering from the many hardships caused by the pandemic for our residents, our businesses, our schools, our nonprofits, and our municipalities. I also appreciate that this is being held as a hybrid meeting tonight, which enables and encourages more participation and civic engagement. And and it also enables me to multitask between this event and the state Senate session, uh, which is currently debating a major voting rights bill. So I, I personally appreciate it. The town of Reading has long been committed to taking a thoughtful, intentional and collaborative approach to local economic development and downtown revitalization. Reading first adopted what is known as chapter 40R back in 2009 and then expanded the size of the district in 2017, making it one of only 37 municipalities in the entire state to embrace this state program that encourages smart growth development and multifamily housing. As we know, there have been many successful development projects in the ensuing years. Reading's um, state legislative delegation Myself, along with House Minority Leader Brad Jones and Representative Rich Haggerty, share your strong commitment to promoting local economic development and creating new opportunities for small business growth and infrastructure improvements. We are proud that Reading's efforts have been advanced by numerous state grants and other technical and financial assistance through the years. Late last year, the state legislature passed a major $600 million economic development bill, which together with all the federal pandemic relief that our state has received, and for which we are very grateful, has been critical to helping our communities to get through the pandemic and to mitigate the economic damage. But we certainly know that more state support is needed to continue the recovery and to help address challenges that Reading and many other communities are facing. The good news is that our state has substantial resources that we will be investing in the coming months and years and years. Massachusetts received approximately $5 billion in American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA funds. This is in addition to funds that Congress provided directly to cities and towns to schools, hospitals, and for uh, some other specific purposes. Our state legislature has just completed a months long process of public hearings to gather input as we prepare to debate an initial ARPA spending bill before Thanksgiving. And I greatly appreciate all the feedback that I've received from local officials and constituents in Reading. These ARPA funds must all be appropriated by the state by the end of 2024, and they have to be spent by the end of 2026. So we do have some time. I expect that this initial ARPA bill, again, that we will likely pass and send to Governor Baker before Thanksgiving, will include money for housing development, particularly affordable housing, climate change mitigation and resilience, transportation improvements, workforce development, local public health, which has certainly been on the front lines of this pandemic battle, um, in various infrastructure needs, and among other areas. Our state, our legislative delegation is strongly committed to investing as much of this money as possible in our local communities. And we will be sure to keep you posted on those uh, details as that legislation proceeds. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to partner with Representative Jones and Representative Haggerty and all of you, and I'm excited for the work ahead. Thank you very much, and I'll now send it uh, back over to Aaron. 
Thank you very much, Senator Lewis. And I'd now like to turn it over and introduce our town manager, Bob Lillisher, for his opening remarks. Thank you again. Um, thanks, Aaron, and thanks, Senator Lewis. I almost miss our weekly uh, calls at the start of the pandemic when uh, Jason was one of our few lifelines to what else was going on in the state. And um, I really appreciate it, as did Steve Mayo, um, how much you reached out to us and shared our concerns and the uh, you know, interesting path we suddenly found ourselves on. Um, tonight, um, I, I thanks everyone for coming. And I, I know there's a lot of folks online as well, and some will watch remotely. Uh, I'm going to talk about our downtown economic uh, growth and development history. Aaron's going to come back and talk about some downtown COVID recovery efforts, which have been significant, as the senator mentioned. Um, we're excited the town has recently been mentioned as a 15-minute neighborhood model community with a downtown that's walkable and offers shops, community resources, housing, and regional transit options. As you can see from the slide here, um, for more than a decade, Reading's been planning for managed growth starting as the Senator mentioned in 2009 when the town first adopted the 40R um, in a smaller section of downtown. Yes. Uh, as, aspirations were for a larger area, but there's some neighbor concerns. And so it ended up being a smaller area, not the whole village. By 2012, as you can see on the slide, uh, the first mixed use redevelopment project had come online to replace the former Atlantic uh, grocery store. And I'm gonna go into some of these in more detail. And much as I personally miss the Atlantic, it does save me at least an hour a week when I go to get, go grocery shopping. I see Mary Ellen, but not too many other people. <laughs> um, in 2016, the Board of Selectmen with the full support of the School Committee, Board of Library Trustees and Finance Committee asked the voters to approve a $7.5 million override. It's the first one in Reading in over 20 years. The effort failed at the polls as over 4,000 no votes were cast and just under 3,000 yes votes were cast or 49% against. Yeah. To the board's credit, they then circulated a community-wide survey and received almost 2,500 responses, which for Reading is a lot. And they were composed of about 40% yes votes, 40% no votes, and 20% who had not voted uh, at all. And they gave the board and the community a lot of information as to why the override failed. One of the requests was that other revenue sources be explored. In 2017, the 40R uh, Downtown Smart Growth District was expanded to include, you can see the shape in purple, the whole downtown. That change allowed additional options for property owners and developers to redevelop their properties, and it added a residential component in the form of mixed use that wouldn't have otherwise been there. And I'll get into the results from many perspectives shortly. In 2018, voters approved a smaller, just over $4 million override by a 60% margin. And it was not until 2020 or eight years later um, that the first 40 r develop, I mean, I'm sorry, 80 years after the first 40 r development that a second wave started, which we're in the middle of right now. Despite the pandemic, downtown Reading had four developments under construction in the last year and a half. And in the following slides, we're gonna take a closer look at some of these. So these, these are the five. We'll look at the former post office, uh, the MF Charles building, the former Sunoco lot, the former Atlantic lot, and EMARC, the former the Gold Street property. There's a quick shot for those watching uh, what it used to look like. Here's a quick shot of what it has looked like recently. Uh, in some cases, a projection, in one case, under construction. <clears throat> for the old Atlantic, the uh, prior site had no dedicated on-site parking. It had public parking in the back and in the front and 30,000 square feet of commercial space. The oak tree space uh, currently on the right-hand side there has 53 residential units, a little bit less commercial, 26.6 thousand square feet, just less than 30,000. A 30 odd thousand square foot garage with 78 parking spaces for the residential units. And a, and a lot of amenities, pedestrian crosswalks, street trees, outdoor public space, um, and uh, importantly, affordable housing and workforce housing. <clears throat> the next one, the MF Charles building. 
wasn't under construction quite as much as some of the other sites, but it was an important, uh, significant change to the downtown uh, gateway. It was and is all commercial retail and office space, but the, uh, the significant restoration preserved a, pr a prominent historic structure and it kept the uh, commercial retail and office spaces downtown. I know they looked at residential on the top floor, but it just never really worked out for them. The former Sunoco lot is now a mixed use infill development, 31 residential apartments with some affordable units, 2,500 first, uh, first floor commercial, over 10,000 square feet of parking with 39 on-site parking spaces, pedestrian crosswalks, accessible, uh, handicapped accessible on-street parking, and expanded outdoor space that supports outdoor dining for food establishments. This is the old uh, former post office site, now Postmark Square. There were actually three parcels, the post office itself and two parking lots that were not taxable in the past. There's now a mixed use, uh, adaptive reuse development, 50 residential condos, some affordable, 8,400 uh, first floor commercial, 22,000 square feet of parking garage, 72 spaces for the 50 units. It had historic preservation and restoration, uh, public park and patio, some street trees, and a nice rooftop space uh, for outdoor dining once, uh, once it arrives. <clears throat> this is the EMARC space. This is the fifth area we just want to talk on briefly. <clears throat> uh, it's now mixed use, again, adaptive reuse development. There's 55 residential units, some affordable, 3,500 first floor commercial, 23,000 feet, uh, I'm sorry, square feet in the garage with 69 spaces sidewalk, street trees, and an outdoor terrace for private use. <clears throat> what does this all mean? <clears throat> you can see that almost 200 new housing units have been added to the downtown just from these five projects, and there's some more coming. There's some also some smaller ones uh, that are on the way. Um, we have, with this growth, it has been a big help towards achieving and maintaining after the census our 10% affordable housing measure which does protect the rest of the community from adverse 40B. Um, in these developments alone, there's been over 41,000 square foot of a new first floor office and residential, I'm sorry, office and commercial. And an important point, point all the residential has what CPDC describes as adequate parking. Now, some of the parking issues that have happened in transit have certainly been related to construction. The construction parking, especially at the post office, was horrendous. Uh, the post office site currently has a challenge with its parking garage and striping, so some of the residents that should have parking are parking outside. But there should not be an addition to street parking from the residential units. They could be from the commercial uses. Um, private and open space have been added. There's a, a lot more better sidewalks, pedestrian access. Um, and some street trees. And you're going to see a presentation um, shortly or a little bit later in the night about some other improvements that may be possible down in Haven Street. And to respond to what the select board heard uh, during that survey uh, from 2017, um, just these five projects to have right now added almost a million dollars of new growth revenue just under that. That's equivalent to giving the school department 600000 and the town government 350000 every year. Um, so it certainly has begun to achieve a measure of economic diversification. And what the folks that did not support the first override but supported a smaller one wanted. Clearly, there's discussion in the community, rightfully so, about this is happening quite fast recently. All of a sudden, is it what we want? And that's an appropriate discussion. Careful continued economic growth in the downtown and Walker's Brook should fulfill the, the desire from several years ago to add more revenue, but it's clearly a community conversation that needs to continue. And with that, I'll turn it back to Aaron to talk um, some of the local developments.
That looks good. Thanks. So thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm the Economic Development Director, uh, Aaron Schaefer. And economic development is the process of proactively helping to create and sustain wealth in a community. Our work is really expansive and includes diverse housing development, business development, workforce development, multimodal transportation development, and community development. And what I really want to stress is that the key to Reading's success is working collaboratively with a wide range of professionals, partners, and stakeholders. Our approach to economic development in Reading is to proactively plan to keep downtown vital, to preserve what's important, and to help Reading be queued up for opportunities. And for more information about the Town of Reading's economic development plans and goals, you can also visit the Town of Reading's economic development website um, where the plan is located. Tonight, I also want to highlight a few of our recent efforts. As you can see in our pictures here, um, we created an outside the box mural program. Thank you to Andrew McNichol also, who's our staff planner and my colleague. Uh, this program was really exciting because we were able to hire seven artists to create original works of art in downtown. And we also created a new digital map and walking tour of the downtown art boxes, which was recently featured in the Boston Globe this past week, which I'm really excited about. Um, our work doesn't stop there. Um, we've updated policies and regulations to support outdoor dining, commerce, and programming. We've expanded the downtown bistro table program, which you can see here. And we work collaboratively with the Reading North Reading Chamber and the town of North Reading to advertise Shop the Reddings and create a regional business marketing directory. And last but not least, we've forged new partnerships and built community capacity by providing technical assistance and support to the private efforts of the Business Improvement District Steering Committee, which Liz Whiteland will be talking about soon. These local initiatives help to keep Reading vibrant. And again, these are just a few of the efforts from this past year. In addition to those local efforts, we are all also focused on economic recovery. A major way that we do this in town is by connecting businesses with federal, state, and regional programs to provide technical assistance and access to funding. The following slides are a summary of emergency funding that writing businesses have received to assist with the financial impacts of COVID. What I wanted to highlight here are the four major programs that we've seen. We have PPP loans. That range is quite large there. That's the way that the SBA data is provided. Um, the SBA also had an economic injury disaster loan program, it still does, and it's still available. Reading businesses um, to the date as of December 2020 have received $1.5 million. The Restaurant Revitalization Fund, um, which unfortunately ran out of funds, um, allowed uh, restaurant, Reading restaurants to receive over a million dollars as of July of this year. And I'm really excited that um, the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant uh, got off the ground and um, Reading businesses also received some substantial funds as of August 2021. All of these federal resources and programs are incredibly important to the local community. I also wanted to highlight regional and state programs. Uh, Micro Enterprise Grant Program um, was funded by CDBG, and I'll talk about this in more depth, um, but I wanted to highlight this really quickly. And we also had a state sector specific small business grant program where writing businesses received about $1.98 million. And there are a couple of other grants that are currently open and available to writing businesses and more information is on the town of Reading's website, but I'm also happy to be a resource. So feel free to call me anytime and I will connect you to the resources that you need. Um, in addition to the summary of the funding received here, I wanted to really highlight an example of the work that we do. Um, the town of Reading works collaboratively with federal, state, and regional partners to provide support for the Reading business community. This example is really the micro enterprise program um, where I can really describe in detail what happened here. I think it's a really good example of the work we do. Um, this program started 
um, before the statewide COVID relief programs. And the grant program provided $25,000 in funding to income qualifying small businesses. This grant money could be used by businesses to help pay rent, utilities, payroll, or other business related expenses. And really this funding was targeted toward businesses that were the smallest of businesses, so less than five employees, and also um, business owners were low income as well. This program was started with the joint support of a regional consortium of 24 communities of which uh, the town of Reading was one. MAPC and the Massachusetts Growth Capital Corporation were also partners. Together, we worked to apply, receive, and administer $4.9 million in grants from the Department of Housing and Community Development to assist our regional businesses. Without this regional consortium, individual communities alone would not have been competitive to qualify for this federal funding. Further, this consortium helped pave the way and provided valuable feedback to help inform subsequent statewide grant programs, which it still does today. To date, Reading businesses have received the $260,000. This grant program is still available to Reading businesses, probably through December or until funds run out, but we think through December at this point. And I really want to stress that, again, this funding was not for everyone, but we're really proud of the work that we did to work with this consortium to be able to receive it um, for the most vulnerable of our businesses in town. And I also really want to thank Larry Andrews at the Mass Growth Capital Corporation, Beth Reynolds, who's the Economic Development Director in the Town of Ashland, and the Greater Consortium for your continued partnership. Can't stress enough how important that partnership was for us. And really thank you to everyone who helped Reading businesses navigate and apply for all of these programs and services. It was really sticky at the beginning. It was really hard to create these programs, um, but we certainly did it um, and did it together. And that was important. And Reading businesses certainly benefited. And with that, um, I wanna introduce our key speakers tonight. Um, we are delighted to be joined by, Liz, uh, by Jesse Wyman, who is an urban designer and LRP consultant of Faberman Design. She will highlight downtown uh, COVID-19 recovery recommendations, and she's been working with the town for at, at least the last eight months or so, Jesse, um, on this project. I also want to um, introduce Liz Whitelam. She is the co-chair of the Reading Business Improvement District Committee. And she will highlight how the Reading community is coming together to support downtown. And Scott Ritter, who is a senior landscape architect with Beta Group, who will highlight how the town is looking forward to making strategic infrastructure improvements in the downtown. And I also want to acknowledge Ryan Percival, who is the town engineer on this call tonight, um, who may jump in um, with Scott at some point if needed. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Jesse more formally. Um, Jesse Byman is an urban designer and local rapid recovery plan consultant, and the town worked with her over several months. Um, and her work was funded through a DHCD grant that the town applied for. Um, and her work was to help us take stock of the current downtown economic climate and to help develop COVID-19 uh, recover economic recovery strategies. And we're really excited to welcome Jessie back for her final presentation. She presented earlier in June about um, some preliminary recommendations. Now she's going to show us her final recommendations. And I also want to highlight that the full report is up on the town's economic development um, page under the local rapid recovery plan uh, website. Um, and again, if somebody needs help accessing that um, website, I'm also available by phone and we can provide, um, we can provide the report and paper as well um, at our offices. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jesse. I'm going to stop screen sharing so we can see Jesse's presentation. And I think, Jesse, you are good to go. Uh, Jane? Can you see okay. the slides? We can see your slides. All right. Great. <laughs> Hi everyone, I am Jesse Wyman. Thank you, Erin, for the great introduction. I am an urban planner and designer with Faberman Design. And as she mentioned, we are the consulting firm that has been assigned to Reading for the local rapid recovery program. And I am here really to present our recommendations for recovery efforts to really help businesses, uh, you know, get back to normal from the impacts that they experienced through COVID-19. 
So I'm going to start with a high level review of what the project is and the timeline that we were working under since this spring. But I want to just remind everyone that the area we're talking about is the downtown, which actually uh, we've identified as the RRP boundary, but it is the same boundary as the 40R smart growth district. So when you hear me talk about downtown, that's the area that we are talking about. So the program, which is the local rapid recovery program was developed by the state and Reading is one of 125 municipalities who applied for and received a grant to participate in this program. The program really focuses on technical assistance to explore the impacts that COVID has had on local businesses and understand customer habits uh, and preferences to develop a strategic plan with recommendations for recovery. So this planning program, this planning process uh, was divided into three phases and through this process we were regularly meeting with our LLRP advisory working group, which included representatives from the business community, the bid steering committee and town staff from various departments. Phase one was really all about collecting data. We also administered a business and customer survey to understand the impacts that COVID has had, but we also wanted to know how customers are shopping and how we can get them back to downtown. That information, as Aaron mentioned, was presented back in June. And since then, we've moved into the other phases. Phase two, we really worked on over the summer, we developed an initial list of project recommendations based on the information that was collected in phase one. And we also were able to work with subject matter experts. Those were individuals and other consulting firms provided by the state through the LLRP program to help refine our project recommendations. And then right now we're in phase three. So the draft plan was presented to town staff and the LLRP advisory working group for review and approval. And we're just here tonight to present some of our key findings and project recommendations. Just to highlight some of the data that we've collected, it was a lot of data that we, that we have. And uh, really the goal was to understand who our customer base is and what their impacts are as it relates to COVID-19. We also took a look at the physical environment of downtown to understand how conducive it is to meeting the needs of recovery. And we also took the time to understand where resources are and where capacity support is needed. So in addition to the quantitative uh, data sets that you see on this slide here, we also collected some qualitative information. As I mentioned, we administered a couple of surveys, but we also had stakeholder interviews with town staff, the Reading, North Reading Chamber and the bid <laughs> committee. So just to jump into some of our key findings, I'd like to start with our customer base. When we think of Reading's customer base, we're gonna first look at Reading residents. Those are seen as uh, here as well-educated, high earning young family households, but there's a large amount of Reading's age demographic on each end of the spectrum with over a quarter aged under age 20 and another 30% that is 55 and older. Now, when we administered our customer survey, we learned a lot about our customer shopping habits. And we learned that customers are usually visiting downtown for dining, um, and this is all before COVID. So we learned that before COVID, they were visiting downtown for dining and takeout or shopping, but generally only visited one business, maybe two at a time. Very few indicated that they like to stroll in our downtown. Uh, they are likely coming for just one reason and then leaving. So we also learned that customers are driving when they're visiting, most likely driving to the downtown, but they are bringing someone with them, whether it's their kids or their spouse or their partner. So for us to really capture the, and keep people in the downtown, we really need to ensure there's something for the entire family to do. And through the customer survey, we also learned that they feel that customers feel there really isn't an anchor in the downtown and that they sometimes aren't visiting because there's just not enough stuff that interests them, not enough stores or restaurants um, that they feel uh, are of interest. So in order to get them back to downtown, in addition to providing a better tenant mix, uh, we're looking at opportunities to bring customers back with more things to do, including outdoor events and arts and culture activities. And since COVID, we know that customers are shopping less in person. It's starting to come back, but uh, I think overall people are still shopping less in, in person. And those that were shopping in person at the time of our survey, which was done in May and June of this year, they felt most comfortable at takeout restaurants or restaurants that had an outdoor uh, seating component. 
We also learned that having more outdoor dining and shopping options would make them more comfortable visiting a downtown business. Uh, we've started to get back to normal, but it's important to keep these things in mind moving forward and as we continue to navigate through this pandemic. So I'm just going to highlight some of the key findings from, from our businesses, both in their impacts and what they would like to see moving forward and what they believe would be helpful for them in recovery efforts. The decrease in customer shopping and receiving services locally had a pretty big impact on Reading's retailers, restaurants, and personal care service establishments. In total, we heard that 74% of businesses experienced less foot traffic than before COVID, 64% were operating at reduced hours or capacity at the time the survey was taken again, that was May and June of this year. And that 39 experienced a revenue decline of 25% or more. But as Aaron mentioned, our downtown is resilient and strong, despite the fact that there were seven business closures, which we actually can't confirm 100%, it was a result of COVID. The downtown experienced eight new business openings or expansions as of June of this year. There has also been the mixed use developments, which were highlighted in the previous presentation, uh, all of which have had first floor commercial space uh, developed in that, in that redevelopment, and those have been completely leased as of August of this year. And at this time, we're only, we only know of four vacant storefronts in the downtown. But knowing that there is impact, a major part of this process is understanding what businesses want and need to continue with recovery efforts. We know from our business survey that there is interest in developing a wide range of strategies, including improving their marketing efforts, attracting new business in the district, and improving the regulatory environment that will allow for more outdoor dining and selling options and better improved parking management options. And the key here is to align those needs with what customers want. So if you remember, they would like to see a better selection of restaurants, shops, uh, outdoor dining options, a variety in retail offerings, more arts and culture activities, and more entertainment. So these responses and this information is not necessarily new to us. It actually has echoed what we heard back in 2019 as part of the Re Reimagine Reading process where they administered a survey which we heard very similar things from our residents at that time. Moving into the physical environment and some of our key findings there. Uh, if you've been to the downtown, you know that it's actually in pretty good shape. Maybe Ryan will, will say otherwise or, or not, but, uh, but part of that is due to the downtown improvement project that was completed in 2008. That project really focused on uh, the redesign of streets, primarily along main streets and then the core of downtown and aimed at really improving uh, vehicle and pedestrian access, but it also included a lot of streetscape elements such as brick crosswalks, new sidewalks, landscaping, period lighting. Uh, the project also updated some traffic signals, included some bicycle detection, uh, all within the center of downtown. Uh, most of Haven Street was not included in that project, and as a result, those comfortable amenities that we see on Main Street uh, were not really observed along Haven Street, especially lower Haven Street. Uh, so there's really an opportunity to improve upon that streetscape and pedestrian safety along uh, Haven Street, and you're going to be hearing more about that from Beta Group later. Uh, but when it comes to the business environment and private properties, we, uh, we observed 138 storefronts in the downtown, most of which are in really good condition. Many of these storefronts are part of redevelopment projects, so they're newly constructed storefronts or renovated storefronts. Uh, that being said, there are still several properties in the downtown that could benefit from improvements to their storefront or signage. So when it comes to capacity and providing support, the Town of Reading planning staff and economic development staff has been really instrumental in finding creative ways to support the COVID-19 recovery efforts. And some of that Aaron already mentioned. Um, and so just to highlight real quickly, again, some of those really great efforts, they've created the Back to Business Toolkit. They created the Bistro Table Program and expanded that program for more outdoor seating. Uh, the town has continued to also build upon their relationships with local organizations, including the Reading North Reading Chamber of Commerce, fraternal organizations, and informal org organizations like the Reading Retailers Collaborative really to support ongoing and new efforts to help businesses recover. Uh, most recently, the town has been part of a conversation for downtown organizing efforts, which we mentioned previously um, in the previous presentation. This effort, which uh, 
begun in 2019 has resulted in the bid steering committee consisting of a private group of residents, business owners, and property owners with the goal of formalizing it into an official business improvement district, allowing them to provide support to businesses while also finding ways to get people back to the downtown. And you will hear more about that project here uh, later this evening. Uh, but moving forward, it's really important to continue to build capacity and leverage these partnerships to help many of the projects that we're gonna be recommending here in this RRP program. So I am gonna cover uh, the project recommendations here through the next few slides and the way they're organized is into these six categories and you can see the full report on the town of reading economic development webpage and in that report you'll also find information on for each project preliminary budget and funding opportunities a time frame for implementation the risk associated with the project key performance indicators so that we can actually measure the success of the projects uh partners and resources to tap into and then a clear action item and process on how to actually get these projects done we've also included examples of where some of these projects have been done before to draw inspiration from some of them are across the commonwealth but some are also drawn from other areas across the country all right so i'm going to jump right into these project recommendations i'm not going to be able to cover every single one in detail again you can see the full report on the town's website um, if you are looking to dive a little deeper. So one of the projects we are recommending is actually really simple. It's just to continue the implementation of the already approved wayfinding and branding system throughout town, focusing more on the directory signage. Currently, the town has started with the installation of parking signs, so including more directory signage and wayfinding kiosks. It will help address some of the issues we've been hearing about with getting people around our downtown while also increasing visibility to businesses on less traveled routes or not off of the main street, such as Lower Haven Street, and also start to tell people that Reading is a destination through this really strong visual brand that was established. Many communities have already started to do this. Uh, I'd like to hire uh, to, to focus on Wakefield. You can see an image on the slide here. Wakefield actually started to implement uh, wayfinding kiosks in their downtown with the goal to bring people from the lake to the downtown. So that kiosk also included uh, information about downtown businesses, but it also includes a historic walking tour that highlights various historic assets, again, giving people an additional reason to walk from the lake to their downtown. Another great project recommendation is to create a pocket plaza, which we've dubbed Haven on High, which would become a passive place for residents to sit and enjoy a day in downtown Reading, while also serving as a plug and play programmed event space for area organizations to activate and draw, draw more people in. The basis for the proposal is a small park, park, either adjacent to the train station or at the intersection of Haven and High Streets without taking any parking spaces away. From there, using that as a pilot project, create small additional sticking points, such as additional patio seating, public art and benches strategically up Haven Street to really draw energy between the train station and the downtown core and make the downtown just feel more connected. Similar projects like this have been done in North Adams. You can see the top left image there of North Adams, which has been used as a gathering spot for groups to host events, networking or simply use the space to remote work, have a cup of coffee, grab some takeout from a restaurant and sit and enjoy. Similarly, another project was done in Batesville, Indiana. They were looking to increase pedestrian traffic and energy in the downtown using simple elements like landscaping, tables, benches, turf. The space has been a great spot to gather and relax. This pocket park was actually a pilot project, which is now being uh, incorporated into a more permanent streetscape design with uh, curb bump out and uh, pocket park elements. So one of the things we observed is that downtown isn't all that pedestrian friendly all the time. While there's crosswalks at pretty much every intersection in downtown, some don't feel all that safe, especially those longer crossings at Haven and High Street. And thinking about ways to encourage more walking in the downtown because it actually is really walkable is to think about it from the pedestrian experience, both from a safety standpoint but from a creative side as well. So the project Safe Connections with Public Art is a great way to marry both safety and placemaking. These solutions are super low, low cost. You're just using paint and flex posts, but they're easy to implement and can easily can really make a difference in intersection uh, safety by shortening the crossing distances while making downtown more engaging and vibrant. 
Other communities have already started to do this, including the examples you see here from Natick, Massachusetts, Seattle, Washington, and Baltimore, Maryland. Reading's downtown is really beautiful. There have been several redevelopment projects that have resulted in new storefronts and building facades, which is great because that really adds to the overall attractiveness to the downtown, making people want to visit and businesses want to locate here. So it's really important to ensure that the private realm is maintained and positioned to attract those visitors and potential tenants. The idea with the storefront improvement program is to create a program that would provide business owners and property owners with a means to make improvements to their storefronts. There are many ways that this type of program can be uh, implemented. Ashland, for example, has a program where it'll match 50% of a project, uh, costs up to $5,000 for facade or sign improvements. Uh, Cambridge is another community that offers this type of support. They issue grants in the amount of 2,500 to 35,000 and it's based on the scope and the scale of the project. And what they do there is that the match of the grant is actually based on the type of work that's being done. For example, they issue a 90% matching grant for ADA improvements and a 50% match for other facade or sign improvements. As mentioned earlier, Reading is very walkable and one of the things that many people love about Reading. However, it seems that there is this disconnect when it comes to walking and parking in the downtown. About 37% of respondents to our customer survey said that the lack of available on-street parking is one of the reasons that they don't visit downtown more frequently. While much of the most visible and convenient on-street parking is near the shops on Main Street, and it's most likely to be full, there are parking spaces elsewhere in the downtown that are still within a short walk to those specific shops on Main Street. So considering the walkable nature of the downtown, it is important to encourage shoppers to park where spots may be less utilized and take a short walk to their destination. So the goal with this project, Walk the Downtown, is that it would be a one day event to get people out and walk along a designated path through downtown, visiting various stations or stops along the way, using wayfinding signage that points people to these destinations, but also includes walk and bike times. This will not only bring traffic, uh, foot traffic to our downtown retailers for the day, but getting people comfortable with how walkable Reading actually is. This type of project was done in, in Manchester, New Hampshire, where a similar project uh, problem existed. So they created this one day event with interactive stations along the designated path, including active stations, public art, and places to sit and relax, all of which were temporary, to really connect and make downtown feel accessible and walkable. One thing we learned from the business survey is that 46% of businesses indicated they established alternative modes to sell and deliver their product as a result of COVID-19. For some, that meant actually building a website. For others, maybe it was setting up a way to do curbside pickup and delivery. Either way, many of them had to quickly pivot to accommodate this new digital world and the way people were shopping. Uh, so it's really important that we continue to ensure that businesses in the downtown are ready to accommodate this increase in digital traffic. The goal with uh, this project is to create a small business technical assistance program that focuses on digital marketing and would provide a mix of services in the form of one on one consultations and workshops in the downtown for downtown businesses really to address their digital marketing needs. This could be the development of a new website, it could be optimizing an existing website helping setting up an ordering platform or help with social media marketing and advertising. Wakefield recently implemented a similar program in 2020 called the Digital Marketing and Training Grant Program. They offered online webinars, which included trainings on marketing and website and search engine optimization. These trainings were free to businesses, and then they offered $2,000 grants to individual businesses to implement digital marketing strategies. I spoke with their economic development director on this particular project, and. It was a huge hit and businesses felt that they were very fortunate to have access to the program. Another project that we're recommending to help businesses recover is the creation of a marketing toolkit for downtown. Since we heard that many businesses were interested in strategies for shared marketing and advertising for the district. In our discussions with staff and some of the representatives from the bid steering committee, we learned that some of this is already happening with our downtown retailers. So the goal behind the marketing toolkit will be to create a collective marketing voice for downtown shopping and holiday events. We know that business owners are busy running their business. So the idea is to create a grab and go marketing solution that will be an easy way for them to help promote district wide offerings and events. A good example is from the Greater Concord Chamber of Commerce where they created a grab and go 
a marketing toolkit that included marketing copy, graphics, a posting schedule, a dedicated hashtag to really get the word out of for an upcoming arts fest. What this does is really creates a uniform effort, including a visual brand that is cohesive, recognizable, and people begin to reference and remember that something is happening. Ultimately, the goal is to get more people to these events, allow businesses to have a collective voice for downtown in a way that's simple and easy for them to do so. Lighting is another way to encourage more foot traffic in the downtown, especially during the short days that we have in the winter times here in New England. Leveraging creative lighting techniques can actually do a few things. It can give pe people a reason to visit downtown and go see the lights. It can help create a more fun and attractive nighttime shopping experience. And people are just attracted to lights. As we know, Haven Street and the businesses down on Lower Haven are less visible from the main street. Attracting them through lighting can say, hey, something's down here, come check it out. A good example that I'm highlighting here is from Wayzata, Minnesota. It can be seen on the left, the images on the right of my screen. They were looking to create and they were looking to activate their lakeside park, which as you can imagine in Minnesota on a lake in the winter is probably one of the most brutal environments ever known to man. Um, so the idea was to create active and passive programming along with various lighting projects to really create this program called Light Up the Lake and bring people to the park when it wouldn't otherwise have attracted people. As I mentioned earlier, Reading actually doesn't have a lot of vacant storefronts. Right now, we are seeing four vacant storefronts, which really speaks to the desirability of the community. However, when vacancies do happen, it can really detract from the overall appeal of downtown. Uh, many communities have started to embrace these vacancies and leveraging the vacant storefront windows as an opportunity to engage their local arts community. Knowing from our customer survey that people want to see more arts and culture activities in the downtown, we're recommending that Reading pilot a vacant storefront window program. This program would engage local artists to create new works or place existing works or reproduced works of art in the vacant in the windows of vacant spaces. The example that I'm showing here on the right is from Worcester, where they worked with an existing landlord to create these works of arts in several storefronts uh, in downtown. Now, that project was actually part of a larger planning project that they were doing. So the artwork was actually a way for them to engage with their customers through QR codes and surveys and asking them what else they wanted to see in their downtown. But it's a really great example on how these windows can be leveraged and engage the local community and customers. And the last project I really wanna highlight is one I think that's really important for the town to consider. And, and that is ensuring that the tenant mix in downtown is ideal, especially when it comes to ground floor spaces. We know that Reading's downtown has undergone a lot of transformation in the past 10 years. And now with the new development, there's a lot more foot traffic in the downtown, uh, especially before COVID, uh, but that is starting to uh, pick up pace with the uh, new projects coming online. The, uh, but the retail mix is something that we know can be approved upon. We heard that many people want to see a better variety of shops and restaurants, which is not surprising because those are the types of uses and businesses that encourage activity and vibrancy in the downtown. However, many of the new spaces from these redevelopment projects have been filled with office and medical uses in the downtown, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but these types of businesses are generally quieter on the nights and quieter on the weekends, not really activating or adding to the vibrancy that communities have when there is a wide selection of shops and restaurants that encourage that window shopping and strolling. So we're recommending that Reading evaluate the existing zoning and site plan review process to see if there's opportunity to identify a true preferred use for ground floor retail space. And also if to, if to see if there's room for improvement through zoning and or permitting. Ultimately through this process, there could be a number of changes that can be done to encourage some of these more ideal uses for ground floor spaces. So those are just the majority of the projects that we are proposing. But in addition to that, we have a few others quickly worth highlighting here in these categories. So for the revenue and sales category, we're also recommending the development of an online marketplace that could complement the Shop the Reddings um, directory that we have already. It would be a spot for folks to come and purchase directly from shops or stores in Reading, Massachusetts. And we're also recommending a calendar of happenings, which would be a centralized uh, location of all events happening in downtown right now. There's calendars, um, various calendars with a lot of things happening. And so a centralized calendar with, uh, would help everyone know what exactly is going on from all the various wonderful organizations that we have in town.
For administrative capacity, that category, we're also looking to create a streamlined way that would allow for and encourage pop-up events and activities that are more tactical in nature with the develop of a pop-up and tactical urbanism guide. And then for the public realm category, we're also recommending a build-out scenario for parking, which would look at build-out conditions for the downtown and ways to ensure that parking access and management is, um, is appropriate. And for the culture arts um, category, in addition to the other projects that I went through, we are recommending that the town create a placemaking master plan, which would really identify locations for placemaking activities, uh, public art, and how to actually get those projects done with local artists. So that is all I have for you tonight. As I mentioned, the full report is on the town's webpage. And if you have any further questions, you are welcome to get in touch with Aaron Schaefer, the Economic Development Director. And with that, I am going to turn it back to you, Aaron. Thank you so much, Jesse. Really appreciate all of your hard work. Uh, it's been really excellent and tremendous. So um, again, really thank you for your ideas. And we're really looking forward to working with our community partners uh, to provide leadership and support um, for some of this work. So um, thank you. And I want to um, introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Liz Whiteland. She's a local bookstore owner and she's also the co-chair of um, the Reading and Business Improvement District Steering Committee. She'll be speaking about Reading, uh, the Be Reading Business Improvement District Initiative, which is led by a private group of property owners, businesses and residents working together to create a professional downtown management organization. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Liz. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, your mic is turned off. You're muted. We need you on for the virtual component. Thank you. You're on. Hello. We got you. Sorry. Is that better? Okay. Sure. Yeah, no worries. All right. So let me reiterate. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> Thank you, Town of Reading, for including the Business Improvement District on the agenda tonight. Um, I am here to talk about um, how did we get to a place where we wanted to form a Business Improvement District. What is a business improvement district? Um, what would it do? And how does it get established? So, um, and uh, also to reiterate what Aaron said, my name is Liz Whiteland. I own Whiteland Books, the bookstore downtown on Main Street. I also live here in Reading. I've lived here for just shy of 20 years. Uh, opened the bookstore about four years ago, um, partially because I am obsessed with books and partially because as the town was developing and improving, um, I wanted to be part of that. As a resident here for years and years, I had heard people say, what this town needs is a bookstore. And uh, to riff on the famous Lily Tomlin quote, you know, somebody should do something about that. Well, wait a minute, I'm somebody. Um, I thought, okay, I'm gonna learn about how to open and run a bookstore and, and try to bring that to our town. So um, that is kind of how I got involved in the downtown area um, as a business owner. And so, all of you in the room and online, out in the world, have undoubtedly noticed in the last several, many years, that the town of Reading does a phenomenal job of constantly seeking input from the residents and business owners downtown about what, what do people want? What do people want to see? What would make engaging in downtown uh, more desirable? And we've already heard a number of initiatives and ideas that have come forward tonight and uh, where we gathered that information. So um, one of the really great initiatives in recent years was the reimagining Reading um, surveys and meetings and forums and ice cream socials and things to really uh, give everybody in Reading a chance to contribute to the idea of what do we want the downtown to be. And then the town also thankfully uh, put together the resources to get some consulting help to say how do we get some of these things to happen? Um, people are not just sitting around trying to uh, come up with projects and then have nobody to do them or no way to get them done. And so part of what was uh, discussed was a downtown management organization. What is a, a group that could just come in and actually help do and bring to life all these visions that people had come together with? And there are different formats for downtown management 
organizations and through a lot of discussion and analysis um, and recommendations, we all sort of came to the conclusion that a business improvement district would be the most valuable use of uh, some of our human capital downtown. So what is a business improvement district? A, and that is colloquially known as a bid, BID, business improvement district. So every time I say the word bid, it's not that we're putting something out to bid. It is that we're talking about the business improvement district. So a business improvement district is a property owner funded professional organization that specializes in providing supplemental programming and services to a district. So property owners within the business improvement district sustainably fund and support downtown through supplemental programs uh, that are above the current town services. So the town continues to provide a lot of the services, well, all of the services that they already inherently provide and the business improvement district is on top of that. Um, and a bid represents an investment in the downtown, an investment in the success of the businesses in the downtown, an investment in the vitality and vibrance of the community, and uh, just a place, uh, just a way to make sure that Reading is everything that it can be. Property owners fund a business improvement district, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and as a result, they control how and where the dollars they invest are spent um, through an independent legal entity. So that is uh, part of what we are working to do now. I am part of a steering committee that, as Aaron mentioned, consists of uh, the committee consists of some business owners in Reading, some resident Reading residents who are just interested, and some of the property owners, some of the people who have developed properties downtown and or are going to develop more. Um, and we've been working to determine what could a bid look like, what could it do, and based on all the feedback that the town has gathered through Reimagine Reading and all the surveys what is it that the community wants and how can we help make that happen? So uh, in a happy echo of a lot of what Jesse recommended and what Bob was talking about, the priorities that the bid has identified, the bid steering committee has identified, a focus on cultural placemaking. So downtown programming and events, including things like live music, the highly desired professionally managed farmers market, various pop-up events, and decorative lighting and public art, public amenities like streetscaping and street furniture. A bid could help create all of these, make all these things happening. A bid could support collective marketing and branding. So helping prospective businesses test local and regional markets, support collaborative marketing efforts with other community organizations, support and or create uh, signature events, develop and implement a professional marketing strategy for the district, which may include a district brand, website, business directory, calendar events and promotions. So again, some of the things that Jesse and her team were suggesting and developing marketing materials. Additionally, the bid could help support, uh, support recruitment of new businesses. So anytime that we do have empty storefronts, we have more additional resources uh, to help entice the kind of businesses that Reading residents wanna see downtown. Part of that could be through the creation of small business grants or revolving loan programs to help creative businesses get a start. Um, through collectively purchasing technical assistance and consulting services for businesses within the district. Provide skill building and educational classes for businesses that may include topics like digital marketing, e-commerce, collaborative marketing, retail design and merchandising and more. And the bid also just uh, would work as an advocate, an advocacy group to help work with the town and with any other organizations that um, influence what happens downtown. I do wanna uh, make sure to emphasize here that the bid does not replace existing organizations. Uh, the bid would work with existing organizations. So um, I'm happy to report, we have a very charming letter of endorsement and support from the Reading Chamber of Commerce. I myself am a member of the chamber as are most of the businesses involved in the steering committee. We've been in talks with the Rotary and lots of other organizations downtown. So when you think of things like the Fall Street Fair, is the Reading bid going to take over the Fall Street Fair? No, we're gonna hopefully provide support to the Rotary. Are we gonna take over the downtown tree lighting? Of course not, The chamber that is the chamber's thing, but we might be able to provide additional support. And then when people envision other events and projects, like for example, the farmer's market, well, nobody's doing that yet. And so that's a place where the bid could step in. Uh, the analogy I used on one of our frequent bid meeting calls was uh, when I am emptying the dishwasher at home and my husband comes over and starts trying to do that with me. And I'm like, please don't do the thing I'm already doing. 
do you want to be helpful? Please go do something else in the kitchen. <laughs> so we do not want to empty the dishwasher when somebody else is already planning a fall street festival <laughs> or downtown tree lighting. That is not what we're here to do. We're here to add uh, additional events, services, and, and programs. So um, how does a bid get formed? So that's all sounds great, right? Well, people have these ideas and we want to get it done, but how do you get that in place? So the bid steering committee has been meeting for many months. And part of what uh, our process has been, has been to identify the actual district because you do have to create boundaries and say, this is going to be the official business improvement district. Um, and it's very similar to, but not exactly the same as some of the maps that you've seen this evening. Um, and for people who would like to see our map, oh, um, I have some brochures here. There is information online, I'll get to that, but there's a place where you can see the specific map. So we've identified what are the boundaries of the, of the downtown, that uh, the business improvement district. To create a bid, um, which is an official entity, but I also wanna uh, reiterate, it is not a town entity. This is not something that the town controls. It is a privately formed entity. So while we are grateful for the incredible support uh, we've been getting from the town, um, one of the things that's nice about uh, business improvement district is it's also not um, restricted by things like open meeting law or um, requisitioning processes. It is, it's a private entity. Um, and the way it is created is that within the district, um, we have created a petition. There is an official process to do that. I should back up and say bids are a thing that exists throughout the Commonwealth and throughout the country. Um, so there is enabling legislation that allows, uh, enables um, areas to create a bid. And so there is an actual process. And the process is you write a petition with specific language outlining where the bid district is. And you circulate this petition to all of the property owners within the district. If 60% of the owners sign on to that petition, uh, representing at least 51% of the assessed value of the property within that district, we can then take that petition to the select board where they can say yes or no, we wanna go forward with this. And if a bid is created, it is created for a five year term. And then every five years, uh, you need to repeat part of the process to keep it going. What the petition is calling for is that every property owner within the district will be required to pay a fee annually based on the assessed value of their property. Um, part of the work that we've been doing over the last several months as a committee is determining what is the appropriate level to ask for to create a budget that funds all the kinds of things that the people of Reading want, but without putting an undue burden on the property owners beyond uh, the value that they will actually surely recoup um, in what these initiatives do. So our steering committee has come up with a 0.2% assessment on the property values, which means that most, um, most downtown properties would be paying somewhere between 50 and $150 a month to collectively leverage that buying power to do things like beautify the downtown, some streetscaping projects, again, some of these uh, events and programs. And so where we are right now, is in the process, we've just finalized the petition and we have started talking to some of the property owners and we've started gathering signatures. And so there's a lot of excitement about this. Um, a lot of the property owners downtown who have created some of the larger developments, several of them of course own uh, developments in other communities. And they've seen this kind of uh, organization work to the great benefit of everybody in this kind of a district in the past. And so, um, we are now at the point where we're gonna be marching around downtown looking for support of all the property owners and hopefully bringing this petition to the select board sooner rather than later so that we can establish uh, the business improvement district. So that being said, um, I just wanna know, I share that um, this is a little complicated. I know I'm trying to just sort of talk through some of what it is. We have created physical materials. We have created a website that you can link to from the town website. And if anybody is interested in this and wants to talk about it more, learn more about it, I am readily available uh, at the bookstore downtown on Main Street, 610 Main Street, um, most days of the week. I'm very, I have actually already sat down and had this conversation with a lot of people who had already heard about it. So if anybody would like to understand further about the business improvement district and, and what we're trying to do, by all means, uh, call me at the store, come see me at the store, send me an email. Um, 
pick up a brochure. They're beautiful. Share them with your friends. And um, I think that's it. So thank you, Erin. Thank you, Town of Reading. Thank you, residents and future supporters of the bid. Thanks, Liz. We're really excited about the efforts and leadership that the bid will provide. And the steering committee has already been working with the town in partnership for quite some time now on a number of different initiatives, included, including the local rapid recovery plan and many other things. So we're very excited um, to be working with you and, and thank you for your time. Um, our next presenter uh, is Scott Ritter. He's a senior landscape architect with Beta Group and the town's engineering department recently hired Beta Group in 2019 to explore some initial opportunities for downtown Haven Street. As this project spans a major downtown corridor, uh, Haven Street and a little bit of um, High Street here, it's also important to have a robust public engagement process throughout the design phase. And we're not quite there yet here. Tonight is the first time that we're really previewing this concept as a concept, and there's a lot more design work and public engagement to be done for sure. Um, so this is the first time that we're really previewing this idea. This project will provide a significant opportunity to make improvements to lighting, landscaping, and programming public spaces for placemaking initiatives, things like Wall Street Fair and the like. Um, and I think this project is really in response to a lot of public feedback that we've been hearing both from the general public and from our businesses on this corridor as well. There are not a lot of um, amenities in terms of infrastructure that really supports the types of activities that we'd like to be doing in this area. And again, Haven Street feels a little disconnected from Main Street. So we're really excited about this potential opportunity. With that, I'd like to now turn it over to Scott Ritter um, for his presentation. Again, he's a senior landscape architect with Beta Group who's working with the town of Reading. Take it away, Scott, thank you. Great. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it. Um, it's been uh, really interesting being part of this uh, past hour or so, uh, listening to everyone present their ideas and what they're looking forward to for downtown Reading. And um, now that we're going to go back a couple of years with this plan because we had done this back in 2019 pre-COVID. So a lot of the things that Jesse mentioned with the um, LRRP, you know, we kind of thought about in a small way, um, but I think oh, the things that she was talking about, I think we can really start to advance and really consider in, in our designs we go forward. So uh, th thank you for that opportunity and, and just being part of this tonight. So here is an overall uh, view of, of our work area that we've uh, been designing the streetscape for and street you know, roadway improvements, uh, this yellow line. Um, we have Haven Street running, running up, up and down the sheet and then High Street and the train station running across the bottom. Um, and Main Street is up here kind of on this diagonal. So um, I think as Aaron mentioned, um, you know, the, the streetscape was redone on Main Street back in the late, or like 2008-ish, I believe. And Beta was fortunate enough to be part of that design process there. So we were able to, you know, start making some of those uh, nice spaces for people uh, in that environment. And the we turned the corner on Haven Street uh, just up to the CVS parking lot ex exit. So uh, it'd be really exciting to take this further down Haven and to High Street. Um, certainly, especially with all the new residential development, you know, those places will provide a lot of people and a lot of natural activity on the sidewalks, hopefully. So that's a great resource as well. Um, so Haven and High Street are, you know, roughly 12, 1300 feet long in the areas that we're going to be working uh, from Woburn Street to Washington Street and then from high up to almost up to Main Street. So that's our rough area. And you can see obviously the you know, we got the post office residential development, uh, 30 Haven residential commercial development, mixed use development on Gould Street. So and also I you know would also include like the Lex that's on opposite side of the train station. So these are really four really vibrant uh, areas that are all gonna be using, you know, potentially using Haven and High Street as a, as a great walking space and, 
and a place for people. So here it's a you know a little tough to see, but this is the same view. We've got High Street running across the bottom, and Haven running from top to bottom. So um, I'll just zoom in a little bit so we can start to see that. So here's the exit from the CVS parking lot, and then we'll continue, you know, um, doing the street work, sidewalk work on on street parking adding trees, protecting trees where we, you know, where it's possible to do so. Um, I, the intent of the street, the roadway work, um, we're gonna be keeping parallel parking, um, keeping the one way or, or two way traffic flows. Um, but I think a lot of our work is gonna start coming into where, the, where and how the pedestrians cross the road, um, doing bump outs where we can to shorten those distances that pedestrians have to cross, make them clearly visible, make them safe um, and easy to use. As we come down Linden towards Gould, I mean, yeah, towards Linden and Gould down Haven, um, we've got a major intersection here with Gould. Uh, again, it's a, it's a place where maybe some of that public art, maybe there's some, um, a space where people can just hang out, maybe this outdoor dining here at this nose. Again, some bump outs to have shorter crosswalks and you know, just a great spot for kind of maybe people to hang out and feel a little more, a little more comfortable. Add trees for shade and comfort. Um, outdoor dining spaces maybe. Uh, again, there's one existing here. Maybe it can be reconfigured slightly to have a little bit more room, offer a little bit more protection from the cars going by, things like that. So we certainly look at that. Uh, as we come down further, you know, we've, we're, keep, we're expecting to keep the uh, diagonal and uh, parallel on-street parking here, maybe narrowing the lanes a little bit so that again, this intersection with High Street is much more pedestrian friendly. And I, I'll get into a little bit more detail um, on this area as we, as we go on. Um, we have some simple cross sections, you know, we've got the angled parking, drive lanes, um, parallel parking spaces and sidewalks and how that all gets, gets distributed and you know, where we can narrow lanes for traffic you know, that might provide an extra foot or two for um, sidewalk space. And if we can do that, maybe there's opportunities that we can reach to uh, have outdoor dining or provide that temporary artwork and things like that along that side. So that, you know, we'll certainly continue to look at that. Um, High Street, obviously we've got the train station. Uh, we're cons looking at this point, two years ago, we looked at expanding that plaza um, there and providing, um, maybe it could be a stage for the fall festival. Maybe it could just be a place where people can hang out a little bit more. There's be bike stores, there's the clock there. This, we can do shade with some trees. Uh, maybe there's a chance to do some, you know, pervious paving or um, urban LID, you know, stormwater treatment so that we provide a greener project. Um, left and right on, on um, High Street, obviously we have the Woburn Street uh, intersection, which is signalized, which will be worked on. Um, again, we've got the four narrower crosswalks or shorter crosswalks to help people get across that intersection as well. Um, parking along High Street, we, you know, we're thinking about, you know, maybe having some uh, greenery along the side just to kind of break up that long, that long view, um, the long edge of parking. If we could break it up with some simple tree planting, that would be great. Um, on the eastern end, uh, where Washington Street comes in, we'll certainly look at some safety improvements there for pedestrians and vehicles so they can, you know, make their way onto Washington Street uh, safely then out to Main Street. I, um, there are some large existing trees on Washington that we've looked at with the town arborist and you know we're, we want to protect what we can there um, because it provides a great green canopy. But uh, there are a couple of trees that I recall that were you know leaning quite heavily over the road and you know as we make our way through that design process that'll be worked out a little bit.
uh, during our design uh, back a couple of years ago, we just started looking at some simple cross sections and um, simple plan views of sidewalks and businesses, um, looking at what was done uh, in the 2008 design, maybe looking at ways that we can help modify and change that with still doing brick ribbons, but maybe doing them a little differently, maybe a little narrower. So the sidewalk becomes a little more wide and a little more friendly. Um, you know, how wide does it have to be to do lights and trees and things? So we've, you know, we're just really looking at this in a very quick format. Um, but I think as we take what uh, we've heard tonight and in going on with that design that I think we can uh, improve on these and make make some better pedestrian spaces here as well. Um, you know, there's new techniques in tree planting for urban areas, whether it's use of structural soils, different tree grades, uh, providing enough good soil and root medium for the trees to grow uh, healthy and live a longer life other than, you know, so often they're just planted in this small little four by six pit and they die in 10 years. You know, they start declining almost as soon as they're planted. So, you know, there's a, a lot of new technology that we're using um, to help with providing, you know, great root zones for, for healthy and long lived trees. Here's a little bit of a blow up of the High Street and Haven Street intersection. Um, just wanted to show a, a few little things that we we're thinking about here. Again, we've got the plaza off to this left in front of the train station, some added greenery. Um, there's certainly a lot of, uh, there's street lighting, which I can show you in a little sketch that we've prepared uh, for that. Obviously, um, I think it was Jesse who mentioned the, the vitality of the street lighting going up and down the street. Um, while this isn't Minnesota on a lake, um, it still, I'm sure, is a pretty windy little corridor. and. Um, people certainly want to be comfortable and safe out there. And if we can get something more than just street lights, maybe we can get um, overhead lighting, um, lighting of trees and different landscape elements. I think that provides a lot of vitality and just interest to the, to the site. Um, we talked about, you know, the uh, angled parking here, trying to get something, you know, uh, parking for so accessible spaces as well as, you know, regular, maybe it's short term, maybe it's, I don't know how, how we want, how the town wants to work the duration of parking. Um, but there's an opportunity, opportunity here to keep that, to, you know, keep the trees, to improve the lighting. Um, we talked briefly, I know with Ryan a couple of years ago, you know, maybe there's a way to get permeable pavers in this area so that we can start decreasing the amount of storm or water runoff that we have from this part of downtown. So, I mean, those are all, you know, great things to try to do. Um, we talked about shortening the uh, distance the pedestrian has to go across the streets, whether it's Haven or High. So we, you know, we've started to draw some bump outs where people can gather and then have a shorter walk across the street. Maybe there's a sitting area with, you know, uh, an urban rain garden and shade trees and stuff that creates a little bit of a place and a space for, you know, people to enjoy as they're walking up the street, they can sit and pause and, you know, whether it's looking at art, looking at the store window, just kind of hanging out, having a cup of coffee, these kind of spaces will, um, can start to spring up if we can find the room for them. And I think that's, that's really a great idea uh, that we want to pursue. Uh, the intersection um, could be all paved, it could be raised, um, it could have art within it, you know, whether it's, it's, Again, what Jesse had showed in some of her slides, um, we can certainly do that as well. Uh, but there's an opportunity here that, so when the when this part of the road gets shut down for the fall festival, this can really become a space where a lot of people can hang out. It can be a lot of activity. Um, you can see we're trying to supplement supplement the sidewalk with, uh, you know, the brick ribbons, the street lights, the same kind of vernacular that we've you know, uh, seen up in Main Street, carry that down, but provide it with a little bit different twist because it's a, you know, a, a different area. It's kind of a different vibe. Um, it's just, just gonna have a different look. So I think it, it will stand out as its own place and space. Uh, and just to kind of, to end, I know this is a quick, very quick overview, um, 
this is a view obviously of, of high street running left and right and then up up the hill up haven um, you can see obviously it's dominated by cars uh, there is some vegetation uh, some vegetation with a new development you know a few small trees here and there and a few older ones but it's just not not a lot there that says welcome to the pedestrian and you know and the you know the cars have certainly the the biggest impact so you know we're envisioning this is how you know this is one of our visions of this intersection and and again um shortening this this dimension that people have to cross you know we still have the lanes of traffic and the parking on both sides we haven't lost any of that we're just trying to make that as minimal as possible providing more space to the pedestrian to kind of hang out uh, maybe there's protective bollards you know crosswalks that are paved you know pavers um, again this whole intersection could be done in pavers it, you know there's lots of options that i think you know the town should look at and can look at um, again we've got a green space over here with some some seating that people can hang out again maybe it's the that urban rain garden um, lighting again something that's historical in nature but it's again it's got a little bit different twist a little bit different image um, you know things like bike racks and trash barrels and bollards and things like that you know we can get the whole family of those improvements to look similar and you know they'll all complement one another so um, again i'm that's a quick little presentation of what we were doing two years ago um, i think there's only room for improvement now that we're hopefully you know we've got covid hopefully under control um, but i think some of those lessons we've learned that people want to be outside dining they want to be outside and share a little space and quiet time i think you know it's a great opportunity for that here so um Aaron, I think that's that's all I have for this evening. And you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you, Scott. Um, great presentation. Really appreciate all of your concepts. And um, with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Jean Delios for some final comments. And we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just have a few comments that I want to share and again express my thanks to everyone for taking the time to come out tonight, especially our wonderful panel, both in person and um, through uh, the wonders of technology. <laughs> uh, this is our fifth annual Economic Development Summit. And uh, we've presented many ideas and strategies uh, focusing on promoting a resilient Reading economy. I am so very proud of the amazing team here in Reading, and I want to express my thanks to everyone, including our stakeholders and community partners. The panel tonight has highlighted some of the ways that we can continue to move forward with economic development, and this is all very exciting. To recap where we've been, the town adopted an economic development action plan in 2016. We hired our first economic development director after that, and we were off to the races. The economic development plan defined priority development areas, including the downtown. And that helped us to plan for where we thought development would be okay. Throughout extensive public outreach, and modifications to zoning and exhaustive work on downtown parking. We've hit the stride in economic development, but we're never finished. There's more to go. Through the downtown smart growth district zoning, we have attracted new investment in downtown and the speakers highlighted that as a key to our success. And it has indeed made us resilient. This has not only breathed new life in our downtown with new and exciting businesses, but we have new residents living downtown that support those businesses and are important to our community. The added affordable housing units have helped us achieve our 10% affordable housing state mandate to keep those pesky 40 developments at bay. Um, this was all identified through numerous other plans, including our housing production plan that most importantly identifies housing as an important community goal. 
We've partnered with the state in many, many ways beyond smart growth zoning. Um, in using grants like the one that we got to hire a consultant to help us with the business improvement district. Um, those are the kinds of things that we're actively pursuing. I'm also very proud of the public art program and the out of the box program that Aaron mentioned. Um, this does a number of things for Reading. It activates the public spaces and these are those metal um, uh, utility boxes that you see around with all the festive art on it. We, wonderful program to bring local art to Reading and really put a stamp on the fabric of the community. And it also promotes walkability through now having this map that's available online. Again, working together with the community stakeholders is a key. And I'm just so very pleased to have our Business Improvement District co-chair uh, of the steering committee here with us tonight. So thank you, Liz. Um, yes, we are changing. And we can do this while preserving the fabric of the community. I believe strongly in the process and I look forward to the many, many uh, public forums we have on the uh, calendar where we're going to be talking more about modifications to zoning, public parking. And I think we have a slide, Erin can pull it up. And while she's doing that, I'm going to read you the vision plan right out of our economic development plan to remind us of how we got here. Uh, Reading is a vibrant suburban town where businesses can thrive and different generations can meet, connect, and build community. Reading's assets include quality schools, a walkable downtown, bike lanes, transit options, including commuter rail service, and access to major roads and a lively downtown with retail shops and restaurants. Reading is committed to strengthening existing businesses, attracting new ones, and expanding the resident base that is needed to support a growing local economy. Reading and community partners will work together to implement this action plan of policy changes, infrastructure investments, and programmatic activities that aims to place the town on firm financial footing and maintain the quality of life for current and future generations of people who choose Reading as a place to live, work, study, and play. And with that, I bring you uh, all these opportunities for community engagement. Um, October 19th, we will be having our first public forum um, for our Your Downtown project. This is a project where we are asking the town what they think about what's going on in the downtown. We'll be launching a survey there's a postcard mailing program that we're going to be executing in the next few weeks. Uh, the survey actually is live online right now if you want to take the survey and give us your feedback. Um, the subsequent forum will be on November 3rd. And again, this is with our consultant, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, who we've been working with to uh, really get into the detail of community engagement. Um, the, the forum on the 19th, will be, the theme will be um, development trade-offs. On the third, we will be discussing um, how zoning tools can advance a vision. And December 1st, we have a backup meeting in case the timeline is a little too tight for the November 3rd. Um, CPDC is, has ongoing conversations about tweaking the downtown smart growth zoning. And we have a lot of ideas around that. There was a zoning workshop last spring that brought out a lot of ideas. Um, but those meetings, uh, if you're interested, are a good opportunity. And uh, I'm, I'm noted as the agendas allow for it, um, discussion about uh, these kinds of zoning modifications. Um, I believe we are looking at December 6th for CPDC to open the public hearing process to get ready for annual town meeting. And we'll be seeing the first uh, iterations of what that might look like uh, for annual town meeting. Um, lastly, but certainly not least, is the PARC, the Parking Advisory and Recommendation Committee. Thank you for, we have at least one person or two people here tonight from the committee. Um, staff has been very involved in that. There's a meeting October 13th, uh, the 27th, and November 10th, I believe, is going to be designed as a public forum to get feedback on parking. The survey that I mentioned that is going out in the form of a postcard will have the QR code both for the 40R zoning 
and for the downtown parking. So we're linking both of those surveys and the downtown parking survey has been around. Some of you might have seen it, but we're linking them together with both QR codes on a postcard to the entire community so we can get a really good, robust uh, feedback from the community. Um, something that we've worked really hard to get. So hopefully we'll get a lot of responses. And uh, with that, I will again just say thank you. Thank you, Erin, for putting this all together. Great job. Thank you all and thank you, panel, and have a good evening. Okay. Also have contact information for the Business Improvement District and Liz Whitelam, readingbid at gmail.com to get in touch with them. And they have their own website, downtownreadingma.com. So thank you, everyone, and have a really good evening. Okay.